we're going to be talking about amphetamines and stimulants. So let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and get out of this. I'm going to bring you to the module here that we're going to be focusing in on. I'm going to be posting your learning objectives here. I want you to know how amphetamines work. I want you to identify the FDA approved uses of amphetamines. Explain what designer amphetamines are used, how they're used, and how ecstasy compares to meth, uh, amphetamine. Um, discuss the dangers of bath salts. We're going to hit on that. Compare the effects of cocaine with those, amphetamine, uh, those of amphetamines. Identify the states of cocaine withdrawal. Identify and compare the sources of caffeine, um, like uh, Xanath drugs. Identify the role of FDA in regulating herbal stimulants. And then you're going to have a discussion item and a chapter review. So here is what we're going to do. First of all, I'm going to start off with this slide right now. And when I talk about stimulants, what comes to your mind? You probably think of coffee as being a stimulant, amphetamines, ecstasy, uh, which has a MDMA, Ritalin, and then there are things called bath salts. So these are just some examples of stimulants. Now, not pictured here are co is cocaine, and there are a lot of other different stimulants. In your book, we're going to be going over the major stimulants, amphetamines, and then moving into the therapeutic uses of them. We're gonna be hitting on uh, talking about cocaine and all those different things. So bath, bath salts. So we're gonna be going right through the chapter. So one big thing about major stimulants is that they increase alertness, excitation, euphoria. These drugs are considered uppers. So they stimulate the nervous system. Schedule one drugs are designer amphetamines, so they've been tweaked. Um, like ecstasy, even though sometimes they can tweak it to try to make it legal, but the reality is it's schedule one. And then schedule two, amphetamine, cocaine, all those are, they're schedule two, so there are medical purposes for it. Um, that's the big difference between schedule one and schedule two. Schedule one does not have a medical purpose. Schedule two has a medical purpose, but is very highly addictive. So I want you to read the article about the history of meth use. And I'm gonna ask you to find one interesting fact and, and discuss it in your discussion post. We're gonna go into the history of, of amphetamines. It was first created in 1887. Um, and then it was starting to have a, some effects of, someone started to document the effects in 1927. This is a German scientist. And he talked about how it reduced fatigue, increased alertness. It makes people feel euphoria. And in 1932, they started to use um, stimulant type of uh, drugs and inhalers, but they started to feel, see that people would become addicted to them. So they started to pull them off in 1971. But one big thing, one big use of amphetamines is to keep people awake. It was used widely in World War II to counteract fatigue. So you went that story that I'm having you read talks about how Hitler used it in Germany to keep people awake. It was used in the Korean War with soldiers. Um, truck drivers will use it to stay awake through the night to do long hauls or just to make things push through. Homemakers have used it, high achievers. Stimulants are throughout every part of society used often just to, to get people's energy level up. This is how stimulants work. What they do is they mimic uh, other neurotransmitters. And what the, they come in, and so look at cocaine, it's the red block there. It's like a red looking like Lego. And dopamine, remember that? Dopamine's your reward neurotransmitter. It makes you feel reward. It um, makes you feel like you can anticipate something. So the dopamine reuptakers are usually uptake the dopamine. So let's say dopamine is released into your system, then it hits the other neurotransmitter that, that signals to make the feeling rush through your body, and then it gets reuptaked, it gets reabsorbed into your body. But what cocaine does is it blocks the reuptake, and, and it blocks it, and then so dopamine stays in between the synapses when cocaine is being done. Now, when I talk about other drugs like meth um, and cocaine, meth actually will start stimulating the, the uh, release of dopamine and also block the um, uptake. So know that cocaine and amphetamines, what they're doing is they're coming in and they're blocking 
um, the reuptake of these neurotransmi neurotransmitters. So amphetamines can cause this kind of flight or fight effect. It puts us in alertness. It makes people kind of jumpy and edgy. And if you've ever seen walking along, you see someone peeing at their skin or jumpy or acting really agitated, they might be on some high level of meth or an, uh, some type of amphetamine. So let's talk about that. There's behavioral stereotypes, um, meaningless repetition of a single ac uh, activity. Ooh, I see a typo. Um, so it's page 308. Go to page 308 and there's a, a story in there about an, an activity over and over and over. I think it was page 308, um, where you, someone will just keep on doing the same thing. For months, I hung out with a crew cooked map. Um, and so it really talked about what happens. And so people get to the point where they just don't even function because they constantly are doing this. And what you'll do is you'll see, what, if you go out to this website, you'll actually see how someone what they look like before meth and then after meth. And look how this person on the left, how her hair's blonde and she her skin looks good. And then after meth, you could see that she's lost the color in her hair and her skin's been picked at. This picking at the skin is one of those behaviors that starts to become repetitive um, because people are overstimulated and they start picking at their skin. But there are approved uses of amphetamines. There's uh, people who use it for narcolepsy. So what is narcolepsy? Well, narcolepsy is when someone falls asleep um, and it's, it's, you do see epilepsy in there. So the brain just like, shuts off and that person will just go into a sleep. Um, and that doesn't mean being sleep deprived. I mean, like I'm talking to you and the next thing I'm, I'm just like out. Um, attention deficit disorder. Um, the attention deficit hyperactive, uh, hyperactivity disorder. And you might be going, well, how would that work? Well, what it does is it creates a increased blood flow to the prefrontal cortex where we like to, where our processing brain is. And it makes people focus and put that energy into that part of their brain. And then weight reduction. You'll see if a lot of people will use stimulants for weight reduction because it decreases that appetite and increases activity. But there are misuses, obviously. There are legal labs that synthesize meth. Um, there's decongestion ingredients um, that they take from the over-the-counter cold medications. And so like you'll go, let's say you go into the pharmacy and you'll go to get Sudafed and they'll make you run the driver's license it's because people have gone in and bought great amounts of Sudafed to get the pull out the, the chemical needed to make meth. And so example of items used in the production of meth, um, you'll see all kinds of things in there from um, Yes, you saw that gas, uh, the fluid, all these chemicals. And so it's really, really amazing how much toxicity goes into meth. It's a lot of different, different types of drugs are used in there. And you can imagine that with these, with this muse, misuse, there's, they have these one pot or shake bake. Um, it's used with a largely, they'll have large, Mexican drug cartel operation. So it's, it's tied to, to drugs and cartels and a lot of gang use will sometimes, they'll, the people will use it to, um, for a lot of um, activity to both um, to fund illegal activities. So here's, uh, this is, these are people dressed up in hazmat suits because everything that's in one of these one pot shake bakes, it's extremely toxic. And so um, they'll have the uh, people will have these places where they're making the meth, and once the meth lab has been discovered, they have to bring hazmat in to completely take it apart. Okay, so two big takeaways from this: one, uh, it's very toxic, and two, it's it's tied to a lot of um, gang activity and to illegal activity. One of the big things that I wanted to do is I'm going to post the um, uh, Kern County Meth Now website. And I'm going to have you do a discussion around this because the drug that gets used the most, and I have right here in front of me, I have the statistics from, um, from the Department of Behavioral Science here where they do, uh, not behavioral science, but they're called 
they used to be called the Department of Mental Health. Now they're like behavioral health sciences. Anyway, uh, she gave me the statistics and 42% of all treatment is a treatment of meth. So, and when you read the meth report, you're going to find, guess what? The number one, number one thing that really pushes um, our system, our emergency system, um, our law enforcement system, it's meth. And when you read the statistics, it's going to blow your mind. And it's going to be, a, I'm going to have it around a discussion question. I want you to look at this because our county is very much impacted by meth. So here it is, up to 39% of all felonies pr prosecutions have meth offenses. Approximately one third of emergency rooms at KMC have used meth. Over 50% of substance abuse treatments. So um, my stat said 42.4%, but roughly um, it ranges from 40 to 50% of all these different drugs that are coming in to get treatment. Meth is one of them. Meth addiction is the principal problem with these drugs. Addiction causes long-term brain damage but here's the thing that you need to know. It is cognitively, uh, psychologically addictive. People physically can get off of meth. It's not like alcohol where you have to wean someone off because they could, they could have um, horrible withdrawals. But for meth, it is extremely addictive um, cognitively, and it's, very, it's a very hard thing to get off. Um, there's no approved um, medications or treatments for meth abuse. So it's, it's really difficult to treat, okay? So that's meth. The next one I wanna talk about is ecstasy. Now, um, ecstasy is MDMA, it's also called Molly, and it's a synthetic drug that alters mood and perception. And what it does is it does both things. It both takes someone to a place where they uh, are feeling kind of, uh, hallucinogenic, but also high energy. And one of the big things, if you research this drug, is not that people die of over abuse. Uh, abuse. What, what the big thing, if you research it, is that they um, injure themselves. Um, and they do crazy things that, that uh, end up hurting themselves very badly. So um, they have raves and parties where people will take ecstasy and um, get really lost in the moment. But here are the effects on the brain. So this is, this is, um, this is interesting. I, I, I think I should have had this slide up a little bit higher. So if you feel like I want you to just kind of stop that, uh, your effect, uh, stop the, the PowerPoint right now and just kind of go back to that, how that, that amphetamine worked. Same principle with ecstasy, same principle is that it's blocking the uptake of dopamine, um, it's blocking the uptake of serotonin. And then um, you can see that it's actually making that person feel emotionally close. So this is how um, MDMA works. So it's very similar to that cocaine slide and to that meth slide before where it's blocking the uptake of dopamine. But what, what it's also doing is it's pushing serotonin also. So it's not only dopamine and norepinephrine, epinephrine, but it's also serotonin, so that's MDMA. So um, let's see if you could get these drugs. At the height of its use, blank percent of the undergrads at Stanford report using it. Blank of these illegal drugs originated in countries such as the Netherlands. An enhanced sensory input is referred to as a, as a, um, a blank drug. True or false, while dependency can occur, it tends to be unusual. And a withdrawal includes blank that can last up for days. Let's see what you guys can get. Ready? 39% of undergrads at Stanford reported using it at one point. This is at the height. Currently, 90% of these illegal drugs originate in Europe. Hmm, interesting. It enhances sensory input, and, and it's referred to as an uh, intactogen. So what it means it does is it combines both a psychedelic and a stimulant effect and it releases serotonin and dopamine. It's been used for treatment of PTSD, post-traumatic stress dis syndrome, uh, disorder, and social anxiety in autism. Um, true, while dependency can occur, it tends to be unusual, and withdrawal includes depression and sleep des des uh, 
disruption that lasts for days. So the next one that I want to talk about, so that's MDMA ecstasy. The next one I want to talk to, to you about is bath salts. So bath salts, um, read about the zombie-like man on page 322. That's a, a hoot of a one, not in a good way, but basically um, it talks about this person um, having a horrible reaction to it. Um, I think it's on page 32, 22, uh, 322. It's a zombie-like um, story. So look at look up that one. And um, talks about how this attacker ignored the commands to stop the violence and was stopped only when shot. Um, and then how the reaction is. So look at that story. Um, and so bath salts, I want to tell you that bath salts are just like what they are. They, they are considered legal in the sense that you can go get them um, at any store and then people inhale them as stimulants, but their effects are horrific. And when I say legal, what they've had to do in Kern County is actually do an ordinance to say that they're illegal. Okay, so you heard me right. We locally have come in and put an ordinance in to stop salts and designer drugs like this. Um, but these are very common and people inhale them. And the next one I want to talk to you guys about is ADHDA. Um, and that, it really talks about um, attention deficit hyper, uh, hyperactivity disorder. And this is when people use Ritalin and these types of drugs to, to get their attention more focused. Sometimes people will actually abuse these drugs and believe it or not, college students have been ones that abuse these drugs so that they could stay focused during an exam or something like that. So that's, that's common. See, see page 223. Do you think it's a, just a fact of life that these drugs will be used on the college campuses to increase cognitive ability? Do you think so? Do you think people are using um, um, Ritalin and Modafilin uh, to, um, to, to get focused? Maybe you don't see it, but it's supposedly it's out there and it's being used. Um, the next thing I want to talk to you about is Oh, and obviously highly addictive. So I'm not definitely saying that anyone who starts to use this, they, you need, they need to watch out because it is a stimulant and it can be addictive. Next is cocaine. Now cocaine is a very interesting drug. It was a major drug concern in the United States, big in the eighties, really big. Um, it was not until the early eighties was it not believed that cocaine could create dependency. Um, and it's not really used by high school students that much, but it is out there. Um, the history of cocaine starts way, way back and, um, and way back. Uh, South American Indians would do it, that it, use it, not cocaine, but they would chew on the coca leaf, okay? That's not cocaine. It's the coca shrub. And then what happened was is that the coca shrub um, then people started to take it and they, they use chemicals and they synthesize it and they used it and they put it in Vin Marina and Coca-Cola. Sigmund Freud used a lot of different types of cocaine. He liked cocaine. And so you could check that out. It's a nice little history of cocaine. Um, but the reality is it's not in Coca-Cola anymore. Okay. So I just want to make sure that you know that. And then they had the third cocaine era, and this is the 1980s. And this is when people started to use it as celebrities and it was just all over the place in the 80s. But it's since calmed down. So you see the trend chart here. This is the total cocaine. And do you see how crack kind of came in? Um, it was like the cheaper form of cocaine. Other stimulants. So caffeine is the most frequently consumed stimulant in the world, it is the most common. And it's classified as a xanathine. And it's found in a large number of beverages, okay? So, and it's also used in over-the-counter medicines. So on the average, the US, in the US, the average daily intake of caffeine is equal to two to three cups of coffee a day. So very common that people use caffeine as a stimulant. And just like anything where people could get addicted, when people get off caffeine, they usually get bad headaches. And it, it's one of those things that people have to wean themselves off of. Um, other stimulants are um, in over-the-counter drugs, allergy, and then there's herbal stimulants called um, 
uh, ephedrine, ephedra, mahuang, uh, guarana, and I, I massacred that last one there. But these are herbal stimulants. And so one of the big things is like, are, can these herbal stimulants be safe or um, be a problem? And the answer is yes, they can be. So I'm not gonna give you a quiz challenge, but I am gonna probably do a Kahoot later. I'm gonna do a Kahoot challenge and I'll talk, talk to you about that. So, um, but I want you to read about the herbal stimulants and FDA's role in it. Um, one of the thing about the FDA's role is that um, they only come in if, if there's been a problem, okay? And I want you to read up on that, all right. Well, I hope you guys have a great week and, um, and I will talk to you soon um, in, in a sense that go ahead and um, it, Canvas message me, feel free to email me any questions. And one of the big things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a discussion post and two chapter reviews. All right, have a great day and great week.